At the death of the patriarch, the care of the family fell upon his widow, Mary Smith. Besides the children, there were several helpless and infirm people, whom for various charitable reasons the patriarch had maintained. These also she cared for, and brought through to the valley the major part of them, under unusually trying circumstances. Passing over the incidents of her journey to winter quarters, and after the expulsion from Nauvoo, we come at once to her heroic effort from winter quarters westward. In the spring of 1848, a tremendous effort was made by the saints to immigrate to the valley on a grand scale. No one was more anxious than Widow Smith. But to accomplish it seemed an impossibility, for although a portion of her household had immigrated in 1847, she still had a large and comparatively helpless family. Her sons John and Joseph were mere boys, being her only support. Without teams sufficient to draw the number of wagons necessary to haul provisions and an outfit for the family, and without means to purchase or friends who were, were in circumstances to assist. She determined to make the attempt and trust in the Lord for the issue. Accordingly, every nerve was strained and every available object was brought into requisition. Cows and calves were yoked up, two wagons lashed together, and a team barely sufficient to draw one was hitched on to them. And in this manner they rolled out from winter quarters sometime in May. After a series of the most amusing and triumph circumstances, such as sticking in the mud, doubling teams up all the little hills, and crashing at ungovernable speed down the opposite sides, breaking wagon tongues and reaches, upsetting and vainly trying to control wild steers, heifers and unbroken cows. They finally succeeded in reaching the Elkhorn, where the companies were being organized for the plains. Here Whittle Smith reported herself to President Kimball as having started for the valley. Meantime, she had left no stone unturned or problem untried which promised assistance in effecting the necessary preparations for the journey. She had done to her utmost, and still the way looked dark and impossible. President Kimball consigned her to Captain's 50. The captain was present. Said he, Widow Smith, how many wagons have you? Seven. How many yokes of oxen have you? Four. And so many cows and calves. Well, said the captain, it is folly for you to start in this manner. You never can make the journey, and if you try it, you will be a burden upon the company the whole way. My advice to you is to go back to winter quarters and wait till you can get help. Widow Smith calmly replied, Father, he was an aged man, I will beat you to the valley and will ask no help from you either. This seemed to nettle the old gentleman and it doubtless influenced his conduct toward her during the journey. While lying at Elkhorn, she sent back and succeeded in buying on credit, and hiring for the journey several yoke of oxen from the brethren, who were not able to immigrate that year. And when the companies were ready to start, she and her family were somewhat better prepared for the journey, and rolled out with lighter hearts and better prospects than favored their egress from winter quarters. As they journeyed on, the captain lost no opportunity to vent his spleen on the widow and her family. But she prayerfully maintained her integrity of purpose and pushed vigorously on despite several discouraging circumstances. One day, as they were moving slowly through the hot sand and dust in the neighborhood of the Sweetwater, the sun pouring down with excessive heat towards noon, one of Widow Smith's best oxen lay down in the yoke, rolled over on his side, and stiffened out his legs spasmodically, evidently in the throes of death. The unanimous opinion was that he was poisoned. All the hindmost teams, of course, stopped, and the people coming forward to know what was the matter. In a short time, the captain, who was in advance of the company, perceiving that something was wrong, came to the spot. Probably as one supposed for a moment that the ox would recover, and the captain's first words on seeing him were, 
He is dead. There is no use working with him. We'll have to fix up some way to take the widow along. I told her she would be a burden upon the company. Meanwhile, Widow Smith had been searching for a bottle of consecrated oil in one of the wagons and now came forward with it and asked her brother Joseph Fielding and the other brethren to administer to the ox, thinking that the Lord would raise him up. They did so, pouring a portion of oil on top of his head, between and back of the horns, and all laid hands upon him and one prayed, administering the ordinance as they would have done to a human being that was sick. In a moment he gathered up his legs, and at the first word arose to his feet and traveled right off as well as ever. He was not even unyoked from his mate. On the 22nd of September, the company crossed over Big Mountain, when they had the first glimpse of the Salt Lake Valley. Every heart rejoiced, and with lingering fondness, they gazed upon the goal of their wearisome journey. The descent of the western side of Big Mountain was precipitous and abrupt, and they were obliged to rough lock the hind wheels of the wagons, and as they were not needed, the forward cattle were turned loose to be driven to camp, the wheelers only being retained on the wagons. Desirous of shortening the next day's journey as much as possible, they drove on till a late hour in the night, and finally camped near the eastern foot of the Little Mountain. During this night's drive, several of Widow Smith's cows that had been turned loose from the teams were lost in the brush. Early next morning, her son John returned to hunt for them, their service in the teams being necessary to proceed. At an earlier hour than usual, the captain gave orders for the company to start, knowing well the circumstances of the widow, and that she would be obliged to remain until John returned with the lost cattle. Accordingly, the company rolled out, leaving her and her family alone. Hours passed by ere John returned with the lost cattle, and the company could be seen toiling along far up the mountain. And to human ken, it seemed probable that the widow's prediction would ingloriously fail. But as the company were nearing the summit of the mountain, a cloud burst over their heads, sending down the rain in torrents and throwing them into utter confusion. The cattle refused to pull, and to save the wagons from crashing down the mountainside, they were obliged to unhitch and block the wheels. While the Tamesters sought shelter, the storm drove the cattle in every direction, so that when it subsided, it was a day's work to find them and get them together. Meantime, as noted, John had returned with the stray cattle, and they were hitched up and the widow and family rolled up the mountain, passing the company and continuing on to the valley, where she arrived fully twenty hours in advance of the captain, and thus was her prophecy fulfilled. She kept her husband's family together after her arrival in the valley, and her prosperity was unparalleled. At her death, which occurred on September 21, 1852, she left them comfortably provided for, and in possession of every educational endowment that the facilities of the times would permit.